Good evening, everybody. So glad to see y'all here. I want to make sure, uh, Pastor Brandon, y'all got any announcements? I didn't ask you before. Anything for CGYA? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, do it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, if, you, if you're watching on live stream, basically what she said was if you're CGYA, uh, December 22nd is the Christmas party at her house. Uh, bring sure to bring a gift, wear your PJs, uh, Christmas PJs. And then if you're going on their trip, which is next year in February, uh, you need to first deposit by then. Awesome. I don't think that, uh, well, there is something for high school, but that's for um, if you're in the high school Sunday school class. You, sh you should have gotten with Miss Kim or Miss Kim gotten with you about the Christmas party for that, which is this upcoming Sunday. If you have questions about that and you're in high school and you're in the Sunday school class, just see Miss Kim Yarbrough outside after that. Good deal? Okay, let's stand up. Y'all move around. Let's get this service started. Well, we do want to take this moment to say welcome if you're watching live stream. We're glad to have you with us. We consider you part of the family, even though... You might be tuning in from a phone or computer. What a privilege to come together the first Wednesday night in December as we get ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. I'm just excited. I encourage us all to come in tonight. Let's just have thankful hearts for what God's done for us this year, for what he's going to do. He, God knows that he still has, what's today, the 26th, and there's 31 days in December. That's really hard math. But he knows that he has a certain amount of days till 2024 comes. And he's not scared. He's not shaken. He knows what you've been praying about. And who knows, maybe tonight is a night where uh, some things change in your life. Maybe uh, answer, uh, prayers are always answered. God answers. But maybe tonight's the night of breakthrough. Maybe tonight's the night that starts off the month of December a little bit differently. So um, let's come in with expectant hearts and thankful hearts. And I'm going to pray for us as always, but I encourage you to pray with me. Let's pray together. Jesus, we come into your house tonight, God, and I just thank you. Thank you for the time that we get together. Thank you that you are the one true living God who has never lost, never will lose. You're not shaken. You're not scared. You're confident. You're victorious. And you give us the privilege of being your sons and daughters. Heirs is what you say, God. You give us everything that you have. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. I thank you for that, God. I thank you that you not only love us, but you want to meet with us. And that's what we want to do tonight here in this sanctuary. God, we ask for your presence in this place. God, I ask for your presence. I don't want to leave this worship set without you. I can't. And so we need you here tonight, God. I ask for your blessing on this service and that you would do exactly what you want to do, God, that there would be no hindrance in this place tonight, that there would be no heart that's too hard that you can't reach. And uh, I just thank you for what you are doing right now and what you are going to do. We love you, Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's worship.
God, we thank you that you're a good God, that we can look back, Lord, even if times that we can't see it right now, but God, we can look back and say, you know, even whenever I couldn't walk, you carried me, God. God, I hope tonight that we can just reflect, because I know in my life there were times I could not walk, and yet you picked me up, and I know that you carried me through valleys. And God, I just testify of your goodness tonight. I testify of your kindness and your grace and your mercy. And I ask tonight that you would open the eyes of everybody in this building to see that in their lives, Lord. That we wouldn't just look at battles that we go through as terrible things that happen to us, but that we would see your hand in it all as you mold us into you, Jesus, as we are the clay and you are the potter. So God, I just sing to you tonight. You have been so good to me. And I know that everybody in this room can testify that you have been so good, God, because that's who you are. And so we come tonight as your daughters and your sons. Maybe somebody doesn't know you in here tonight. Maybe they would from this song, Lord. But I just say you have been so good to me. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I call you For the promises you've kept and every need you've made, Lord, I'm so grateful. I know you were with me every step, and I never will forget. Cause when I think of how you've blessed me, how you
Amen. As we close out this worship set, let's just uh, take a moment. I just want to take a moment before Pastor Gary comes up. I'm going to pray for us before he preaches. Let's just thank God for his goodness. Jesus, we thank you that you are a friend. What a friend we have in you, God. Earthly friends may let us down, but you never do, Lord. We can count on you, and we thank you for that today. God, I pray for Pastor Gary as he brings the word tonight that you would anoint him, God. The words spoken from him would fall on good soil tonight, God, in our hearts, good soil in our lives, and we thank you that you want to meet and talk with us tonight. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. So good to be with you in the house of the Lord tonight. Give everybody a minute to get settled in. Amen. If you follow the rotation in Common Ground, you'd know that I'm not Pastor Brian. He's supposed to be preaching here tonight, but Pastor Brian had a family emergency in, out in Iowa, so he got on an airplane this morning, him and his mom, and they went to Iowa to be with an uncle who is sick out there, needs the Lord's touch, needs a touch from the Lord. So uh, I'm a last-minute pinch hitter. And so I'm going to need a little grace from you tonight, if that's okay. And um, we'll see how what the Lord's got in store for us tonight. Amen. I do want to take just a minute before we get started. I want to pray for, um, his name is Larry. I want to pray for him out in Iowa. And uh, let's just listen. God is God all over the United States and all over the world. Amen. Amen. And if I believe that God can heal in this sanctuary, then I know that God can heal in that hotel room in Iowa. Amen or that uh, hospital room in Iowa. So will you stand with me today? His name is Larry. Let's pray for him tonight and that family that God would supernaturally intervene right now through our prayers. So help me pray. Father, thank you for the privilege and the honor to be here tonight, Lord. God, we come at a special time, God, where we lift up uh, Brother Larry to you tonight, God. You know the physical needs in his body right now, God, that uh, we know that only you can intervene right now, Father. So in that hospital room in Iowa, right this moment, Lord, let the Holy Spirit supernaturally begin to put the, the body back together, Lord, begin to heal the body. And God, I pray for the family. I pray for his wife, and I pray for the extended family, God, that you would just encourage them to, to keep the faith, Lord, and keep praying and lifting up, God. And God, we just thank you for all that you do. We give, give you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can be seated. In uh, 2018, in 2018, I was working for a company um, that I had been with for about 37 years. Uh, working for them, I know that that's hard to believe when I'm only 40 that I started work when I was three years old, but it's true. And uh, amen. But I had been with this company for a long time, and they had. Always, I was a, I'm a sales guy. When, I, when I'm not preaching, I have a job outside of the church, and I work for a, a, an electrical distributor, and I'm a sales guy, and I've always had, for a number of years, a company car. And so in 2018, my company decided that they no longer wanted to provide company cars, and so they told me that I would have to go get my own vehicle. So I didn't have a vehicle to drive, so I'd always wanted a truck, and so I went and bought a brand new 2018 Chevy Silverado, whoop, whoop, go Chevy. <laughs> and um, so, uh, man, I, I love that truck. It's actually the truck that's sitting out here. I drive it. I still drive it to this day. And um, so I'm saying this not in a way to brag, but because it's just kind of my nature, and I'm saying it because it'll make sense to you in just a minute. But I worked really hard because I wanted to get the truck paid for because I don't like car payments, so I worked really hard, doubled up on payments, and got it paid really quick. And uh, so me and my wife, we had a truck, and, uh, man, I was so excited. 
And then uh, one day, my son-in-law, Travis, and I was uh, pulling a trailer. I'm not going to blame it on Travis. I should have known better. <clears throat> but one of us, and it wasn't me, closed the tailgate on the truck. And uh, while we were driving, the tailgate fell down. And when I turned with the trailer, it crushed the tailgate on my semi-new 2018 Chevy Silverado four-wheel drive LT. Okay. <clears throat> so um, $1,700 later, I had a new tailgate. And so things are rolling. We are back on the road. Uh, some time goes by, and I recognize that during the summertime that the air conditioner isn't cooling anymore. And so I had to put a new air conditioner in the truck, $1,200. A little more time goes by, and I recognize that when you're driving a Chevy Silverado four-wheel drive LT loaded, you can't be putting a key in the door to unlock the door. You've got to have the electric door locked. Boop, boop. All four of mine quit on the truck. $1,200 later, I had all new door locks. I'm back in business. Doop, doop. Things are rolling along. Some more time goes by. My wife and my family were up in North Georgia on a vacation. I'm on my way home. I get to the Glen exit right here at the Journey store. My truck won't go into gear anymore. I have the truck towed. Well, actually, I did not. I lent the truck from the exit to the Journey station. I had the truck towed from there to Birkin Chevrolet. And after diagnostics on the truck, I was told, quote, unquote, catastrophic engine and transmission failure at the same time out of warranty. $16,000 later, I got a brand new engine and I got a brand new transmission. Time's rolling on. I pull out of my son-in-law's driveway. It's dark. I don't see the mailbox. <laughs> driver's side door. Right down the driver's side. Still not fixed. So let's go on. A few weeks ago, I'm picking my grandson up at McClendon Elementary School. The sign is dangling from the window and it is aggravating me to no end. So I reach up there to move the, win the thing from the window and it gets stuck. And so I'm piddling with that and the next thing you know, I hit the pole that locks the gate <laughs> at McClendon Elementary School. There are people in line <laughs> that are looking at me. And my son, my grandson said, Papa, what was that? I said, don't worry about it, son. Don't worry about it. So I never looked at anybody, and I drove away, and I felt really bad. So I text Carrie Anderson. I said, Carrie, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've tore the school up. I have took the pole out. I didn't think it was bad. I did not think it was bad until I looked at the front of my truck, and it is pretty bad. $1,000 later. I haven't got that fixed yet either. So I came home. I got expelled from the school. I'm not even allowed back there anymore. Actually, Carrie, you'll find this funny. Corey was out of town and asked me last Friday if I'd pick Austin up from school, and I told her that the pain was still, the wound was still a little open. I better not go back out there. So I, I declined. So I paid Carrie, my daughter Carrie, to go pick him up. Um, but we, I, I said all that to, to say this. Why in the world would I do all that? I mean, I got home that day after hitting the pole. I'm busily visibly upset, I'm emotionally distraught, and I'm just looking for comfort. And so I got the courage up to tell my wife, and I walked into my son-in-law and daughter's house across the street where she was babysitting, and I said, I got to tell you something, I've wrecked the truck, and I'm looking for that comforting words, honey, it'll be all right. And she looked at me and said, listen, by the time you get rid of that truck, you'll have over $200,000 in it. $200,000 in a truck. Now, I said all that, and I said that story to say this. Why would I invest so much into the truck 
actually more than it's worth? Why would I invest so much in that truck that's actually not worth as much as I've invested in it? And the answer is simple. It's because I want the truck. I love the truck. I want the truck. It's valuable. Maybe not to you, but it's valuable to me. I want the truck, and it's important to me. I want the truck. And so I overlooked the cost of everything I had to do to the truck because the value to me was far greater than the cost. I overlooked all the money that I put into the truck because although it was worth a lot less than all the money I put into it, the value of the truck was far greater to me than the cost that I had put into it. So tonight I want to speak to you on this thought. Stop looking at the cost and start looking at the value. Stop looking at the cost and start looking at the value. Now, I have always been a math guy. Anybody else in here like math, like working with numbers? Not many, but there's a few of us. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to have a math test tonight, so there's probably about three of us that's going to pass, but that's okay. <clears throat> I like working with numbers. Uh, I like figuring things out mathematically. Sometimes I see things different than other people do through numbers. I see things different, and uh, that's not, not bad. I mean, I, I know that might sound confusing, but I want to ask you a question based on the way that I see things and I'd like to get your opinion and see what you think. So you guys game for that? So I need you to use your imagination for just a little bit. <clears throat> Imagine that I have a car, and uh, my car payment is $500 per month. And so I want to sell the car, and so in month number one, I put the car up for sale, and I want $5,000. The best offer I get in the first month is $4,000. But I love that car, and I can't sell that car for $4,000 because I want $5,000. So I'll make a $500 payment. I put it back on Facebook, virtual marketplace, $5,000. Another month goes by. I get another offer, $4,000. There's no way I'm taking $4,000 for a car that means $5,000. So I make another payment, $500. Third month rolls around, $5,000. I get an offer for $4,000, not taking it. So I make another $500 payment. Fourth month rolls around, I sell the car for $5,000. Boop, boop. The question is, did I make a good deal or did I make a bad deal? How many people think I made a good deal? How many people think I made a bad deal? In my mind, the way I see things is I made a bad deal. I spent $1,500 to make a 1000 Man, it's so good to see Noah. I, knew you, I saw you walk in, man. Good to see you, brother. How's things going in Carolina? Good. Huh? Did you? You bring this cold weather with you? I hate it, too. No, I don't hate it. I like it okay. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. I made... $1,000, but it cost me $1,500. So in my mind, I didn't make a very good deal. But my question tonight and why we go through this is, is this. What if God approached a relationship with me and you like a business deal? What if God's commitment to me and you was based on a business deal? Uh, <clears throat> What if it was all about the cost to redeem us and not about the value that's placed upon us? What if it was all about the cost, but it was never about the value? What if God said, listen, I'm going to assign a value to you, EJ. And when you go through this life, if you ever get where it costs me more than this value, I'm walking away from you. I'm out. What if God approached a relationship with you and I based on the cost that he assigned to you and not the value that he placed upon you? 
do we ever look at the cost of following him, you and I, do we ever look at the cost of following him with no regard to the value that we get by following him? So hang with me just a second. People are walking away every day because they perceive the cost of following God, following Jesus, being in a relationship with him. The cost is far too great. And they're walking away from their relationship every day. And the reason that they're walking away is because they don't understand the value. People are not entering into relationships with Jesus Christ because you're looking at the cost with no regard to the value that comes with it. John 3.16, very familiar verse. Everybody in here could probably quote it or pretty, come pretty close, but it gives us a beautiful picture of how God conducts his spiritual business. Verse 16, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a small word in the beginning of that scripture for God so. I want to hang out with so for just a second. Two-letter word, very powerful. If you guys understand this word, it's going to change your meaning of how you perceive and how you understand John 3.16. A lot of times we stand up in churches and people take their arms and they say, for God so loved the world, stretch your arms out as far as they can, identifying that Jesus died on the cross. I'm not telling you there's anything wrong with that. Here's what I want to do. I want to present it to you in two ways. One of the ways that we could view this verse is for the so, for God's so, to mean the extent or amount of God's love for the world. This is how much God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Quantity. Amount, value, okay? The second way that we could look at so is to mean the manner or way that God loved the world. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. This is how God loved the world versus this is how much God loved the world. How much is a value, how is a way. So there's two different ways to look at it there. Hopefully this isn't too confusing to you. It might not seem like a big difference, but the meaning of so will completely change the way that you read, understand, and be impacted by John 3.16. Here's why. When we read God loved the world so much, our focus is immediately put on us. So what we say when we say, for God so loved the world so much, amount, It becomes everything about us. God loved the world so much. God loved Gary so much that he sent his only son. And what that says is God can't live without me, that I'm so important that God sent his son just to buy me back. And it becomes very self-centered, self-focused. And it becomes very selfish that I would think in my mind that God loved me so much that I was so important even in my sinful state, that God would send his son to die on a cross just to have an opportunity to get me back. Isn't that a pretty arrogant way to look at it? It's saying he couldn't simply do without us and would do anything to get us back. The difference is uh, no small thing, especially in our idolatrous culture of self-love. One of the greatest lies is that God needs us. He doesn't need us. That idea is the heart of all false religion. God does not need us. God doesn't depend on us and needs nothing from his creation. God is not looking for nothing from me. There's nothing that I've got that I can give God that God is looking for other than my heart. So the thought that I would, for God so loved the world, that he would do anything to get me back is one way to look at it. But let's look at it the other way. When we read, this is how God loves the world, however, our attention rightly focuses on God. It reveals to us something about God and the nature of his love, namely that it's entirely boundaryless, it's selfish, selfless, and gracious. It's not because he needed us that God loved us this way, quite the reverse. 
It's because we need him. Now all of a sudden, John 3, 6 changes. For God loved the world so much. For God so loved the world this way that he gave his only... Why? Not because he needed me, but because I needed him. And I needed him long before I knew that I needed him. And God knew it. And God knew it. So which one's right? Well, if you follow the Greek and where the translation comes from, you'll find out that the second option is the correct translation. It's how God loved the world, not how much. It's how he loved us. And so if you want to study that, go to your Greek and look it up. It's how God loved the world. And how he loved us was by giving his son to come and die for us. The Bible, or the Bible says that God loves the world, for God so loved the world. Now, that seems like a big place, and a lot of people and may feel like God has grouped us all together into one large group. God loves the world. God loves the world, everybody. And uh, that's true. Now, while that's true, uh, it's much deeper than that. The world is comprised of people from all walks of life, from many different places and many different colors. Yet the Bible teaches us in Psalms 139, 13, it says this. This is God speaking. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now it gets very personal. And then he says in verse, it says in verse number 16, Your eyes, God's eyes, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God knew you before you were ever uh, birthed in your, in your mother's womb, before you ever was consummated in your mother's womb. God knew, and he ordained the steps before they ever took place. So now when it says, for God so loved the world, it's very personal. It's very personal. He is sending his son Jesus to earth because he knows you. He is sending his son to Jesus to earth because he knows I need him and he knows you need him and he did this before we ever came to the realization that we need him. Can you imagine that before you were ever born that God sent his son Jesus to earth because he knew that we needed him before you were ever born? God knew that you was going to need him and that I was going to need him. And so I sat here tonight and I can look at you and I can say, you know what, I need the Lord. I need the Lord, not, not because I think I need the Lord, because God tells me that I need him, that I'm not worthy enough on my own to do anything in order to get to heaven. I've got to have the Lord, and so I need him. You see, John 3.16 is about the value God places on our needs. Lost without him. We're lost without him. That's the value places on our needs with no regard to the cost sacrificing or sending his son that he was willing to pay. If God had focused on the cost, here's a question for you. If God had focused on the cost of sending his son and not the value, would there be a means of salvation? If God focused on the cost that it was going to take to redeem me, would there be an avenue for salvation. I'm so thankful that God doesn't look at what it costs to buy me back. He looks at the value that is placed upon me, that I need him so much that he would send his son to die for me. Now, we know the motivation behind God sending his son to die on the cross, but what about our motivation to commit to him? Let's, let's switch it around. We know why God sent his son because we need him. But what about my motivation to ask Jesus into my heart? What about your motivation to ask Jesus into your heart and enter into that relationship? Remember, God's, we're math guys and gals tonight. So remember this, God overlooked the cost because he concentrated on the value. So you and I are the same way. 
when we make a decision or are presented with a choice of entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't care what you say, we always look at the cost and the value. You always want to look at the cost and the value, whether you think you do or you don't think you do. So let's look at that relationship <clears throat> with Christ from our perspective. The enemy has influenced our way of thinking to measure relationship with Christ like this. Is the value of, listen, this, you got to catch this. Is the value of, of something in the future that I can't see now, which is heaven, is the value of something that I can't see now, that I only hear about and read about, heaven, worth the cost of what I will have to give up? Friends, habits, selfish desires that are tangible to me right now. That's where we're at. When Pastor Brian or Pastor Brandon or myself, Pastor David, Pastor Tim, somebody gives an altar call and says, hey, if you need to give your life to the Lord and the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart, What's going on in your mind? What is the cost based on what I'm going to get? And if you don't know the value of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll always, always, always default to the cost. I'm not sure I'm willing to give up friends. I'm not sure I'm willing to give up my selfish desires. I'm not sure I'm willing to give up activities. I'm not sure if I'm willing to give up anything in order to, to be in a relationship with Jesus. Unfortunately, many people are weighing the cost more heavily than they are the value. They, they simply don't understand the value of being in a relationship with Jesus. They don't understand the value of being in a relationship with Jesus. Do you know how many people, I mean, we even have a story in the Bible where a man walks away because he, God tells him, says, sell everything you got and come and follow me. And the Bible says he turned around brokenhearted, I'm paraphrasing, because he had much wealth. The cost was far too great to sell it all because he didn't understand the value of what he's going to get. There was an article written by Christ Presbyterian Church entitled, Why Do I Need God? Why do I need God? The writer said there are two main reasons why we need God. Number one, we are in search of freedom, and although man sees a relationship with God as a list of do's and don'ts, it is really the relationship with Christ, Christ that gives us the freedom that we long for. There's not a person sitting in here that is not looking for freedom, whether it's freedom from parents, freedom from addiction, freedom from oppression, freedom from depression, freedom from school, freedom from whatever it is that we're trying to get away from, that we're oppressed and held back from. Everybody wants freedom, but they're looking for freedom in all of the wrong places. And freedom that we're talking about tonight only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you can look until you're blue in the face, until you can't walk anymore or look anymore or read anymore or whatever. But until you understand the value of entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that it is that value that gives you the freedom that you're looking for, you're always, always, always going to be in bondage. The freedom of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ has a value. But in order to get that freedom of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have to pay the cost. And that's what we don't like to do. The second reason we need God is because we find our worth in him. Ooh, think about this just a second. This is fixing to get good. We find our worth in him. The Bible says that we were made in God's image. Every person in this sanctuary is made in God's image. And it does not matter what you do, where you look, or how many self-help books you read. Our true worth is only going to, come to be found in a relationship with him. You cannot, you cannot know your value unless you know the one who values you. You can't know your value unless you understand the value that somebody has placed inside of you. You're in the image of God. Your value is great. And the only thing you've got to do is understand that you have to pay the cost in order to get the value and your self-worth goes through the roof. 
but you're wanting to hold on to a little bit of the world and try to have the value that you want from uh, the world and, 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 and you want in your relationship with Jesus, but you're not willing to give up anything. We're wanting to hold on. We, here's what we do. We try to cut a deal that allows me to pay as little as I can and get as much as I can. And so we, we go into a bargaining. We start bargaining with the Lord. God, I'll do this if you'll do this. God, I'll do that if you'll do that. And God is not that God. God is not in the, in the, in the bargaining business. God says, God says, give up everything and follow me. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. There's a cost associated with it. But if you don't understand the value of what you're about to get through that, you're never, ever, ever going to be willing to pay the cost. Think about it like this. If you were going to install new flooring, let's say we was going to install new flooring in this sanctuary, uh, would you determine how much uh, flooring to order by measuring the size of the room with a random stick? I start in this corner and I say one stick, two sticks, three sticks, ten sticks, fifty sticks. And then I start up here and I go one stick, two stick, 50, and they'll go down to floors and more. And I say, I want some brand new vinyl flooring and I want 102 sticks by 76 sticks. Load me up. What are they going to do? They're going to look at me like I'm crazy. Why? Because I'm measuring with something that's not intended to be used for measurement. Do you know that you're measuring yourself every day in a way and with things that were never intended for you to measure your self-worth with? You've got a random stick measuring your self-worth. You should be measuring your self-worth against the image of Christ. You should be measuring your self-worth against the image of Christ. I have, I have been made in the image of Christ. My self-worth is great. But we're satisfied to take a random, listen, what do I mean by a random stick? How many, how many thumbs up I get on Facebook? How many friends I got? How many followers I've got? I don't even know. I'm probably saying all this wrong. Because I don't, how many, how, many, how many people like my post? You know, as long as I can be better than the, the person sitting next to me, then I'm doing pretty good, right? And so I measure my worth Against the bottom, that's a good one right there, Brandon. You were to preach that one time. People like to measure their worth against the bottom when we should be measuring our worth against the top. And all we want to do is just be better than the one that's below me. Instead of being saying, I'm going to strive to be like the one that's above me. And so you walk through life satisfied. At least I'm not at the bottom. I feel pretty good about myself. Got one foot in the world, one foot in the church. Didn't cost me very much. I get to say I'm a Christian. I get to go to Wednesday night. I don't find myself in the Baker County Press, in the police ads. I'm doing pretty good. But you're miserable. You look in the mirror and you don't like what you see. Listen. We're measuring ourselves wrong. We're measuring ourselves the wrong ways. We all have some sort of measure stick that we use to determine our value as a human being. When we feel like we're measuring up, we feel good about ourselves, but when we feel like we've fallen short, our self-esteem can plummet. Despite the fact that our measuring stick has so much influence on how we feel about ourselves, most people aren't even conscious of what they're using to determine their self-worth. You don't have any idea what you're using to measure your self-worth. Huh. But they're conscious of the fluctuations they experience and how they feel about themselves. You're very conscious of that. Today's a good day. Not so good today. Yesterday was a good day. Hope tomorrow's better. You, you're very sensitive to the fluctuations and how your emotions, your self-worth goes up and down, but you have no idea what you're measuring it to. And can I tell you that I would tend to... to 
to aspire to the thought that maybe every day you're measuring your self-worth against a new measuring stick, whatever the trend is today. There's five common ways that people measure their worth, <clears throat> who they're surrounded by. I measure my worth by who I'm surrounded by. Am I with the right people? Am I in the right clique? Am I in the right group? I measure my self-worth. What you do, we measure ourselves by what we do. I'm the star quarterback on the football team. I'm the head cheerleader. I run the band. I, whatever it is that you do that um, makes you feel good about yourself, that allows you to measure yourself in a particular way. How much money you have. Money is a relative term that means possessions. Listen, <clears throat> how many times it's not going to mean anything to y'all because y'all are young. But there's a few of us in here that's a little older that think that I, when I look at the news and I see that young people are standing in line for 48 hours because the new iPhone is coming out and you want to be one of the very first ones to get it and you want to make sure that you can walk down the street and say, look what I've got, and you hold up this phone that's an iPhone 27 that looks exactly like my iPhone 15 right here. Okay, and I couldn't tell the difference between your iPhone 15 and my iPhone 27 or whatever. But, man, you're going to tell everybody I got a 27. Look at me. I got a 27. There's a new one out right now. It's titanium. Have you seen that one? Let me tell you what that is. That's old chrome just painted. There ain't no titanium in there. You couldn't afford it if it was titanium. You want to show me it's titanium? Take a 357 and shoot it and see if it goes through it. If it does, it is not titanium. Okay. If you paid $1,500 for that, bring it in here. I'll, you got a gun. Go get your gun. We'll shoot it right now and just see. I'm telling you, the world is selling us a lie. They're telling us that we can buy our way into self-worth. If you got the latest cell phone, you got the best car, you got the this, you got the that, you're going to be accepted. That's not true. Because can I tell you what? You walk down the halls of Baker County High School, I got an iPhone 27. Titanium. And as soon as you walk in the door, they're gathered over there talking about you. Can you believe how arrogant they are? I think they got a top. Listen, people don't care what you're toting. They don't care you got a, what kind of, what number of phone you got. Listen, listen. You got to understand what I'm trying to tell you. I did this one time in, on a Sunday morning. I was I was speaking to the in the main sanctuary, and we had a volleyball trophy that we put in that hallway. And every Sunday morning, 500 people walk by the volleyball trophy. Nice trophy. So I held the trophy up, and I said. Who was on the team that won this? Not one person could think of somebody on the team that won it. Why do we have the trophy? We don't know. We don't know who was on the team. We don't know what year they won it. We don't know the name of the team. We don't know anything about it, but we got a trophy. There are people that's walking around today in this sanctuary. You got your little trophy, and people don't even think about you anymore, man. You walking around with your little trophy. I did this. I got an iPhone 27. People don't care about your iPhone 27. You better start wondering about the value of who you are and what God thinks about you and quit worrying about the cost of what it's going to you, uh, cost you to be in that relationship because when you pay the cost to get in that relationship, there's two things that's going to happen. You're going to receive freedom like you've never experienced before and you're going to receive a self-worth that you can't even begin to imagine. Amen. Amen. Listen, that was good. I'll get off the iPhones. Let's talk about the galaxies for a minute. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. I want to get serious with you for just a second. I, I'm about through. I got two, two pages. There are some sitting here tonight that means, seem to have everything's headed in the right direction. That's one of the biggest problems. I like speaking at the Hope Center, at the Hope Center. It's an addiction center where people come on Tuesday nights 
and they're drug addicts or, or alcoholic addicts. Is that even right? Alcoholic addicts? Or are you alcohol addict? It doesn't matter. Alcoholics. They're recovering. They're trying to get their lives together. And so I, I love to go down there. You know why? Because they're raw. They're there for a reason. They, 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 don't, they don't listen. They may wear a shirt in there that's got 47 four-letter words on it that you're not allowed to use. Okay? They don't care. They're looking for something. They're looking for two things. They're looking for freedom, and they're looking for self-esteem. And they don't bring all the baggage in. We Listen, we come into a church like this, man. We're so prim and proper. So when I stand there on a Tuesday night and I look at it at 30 or 40 recovering drug addicts, I know exactly what I got. I look out here at you, man. You're all put together. You're all prim and proper. And so the only thing I know about you is what you allow me to know. But let's talk about this. You're not around everybody all the time. And there's going to be times when you're not around people. And that's what I want to talk about for just a second. What about when you're by yourself and you look in the mirror and you really don't like what you see? The reflection in the mirror actually disappoints us. The reflection in the mirror reminds us of the poor choices we've made. The reflection in the mirror reminds us of the disappointment that we've caused others. The reflection in the mirror reminds us of what has been lost. The reflection in the mirror feels like a dead end with no escape possible. The reflection speaks louder than anyone or anything, and it says, you are not worthy. I'm not naive enough to think that we're sitting in a sanctuary tonight that everybody's got it put together. I know that the Holy Spirit would be dealing with a heart in this place tonight of somebody that's looking in the mirror in the morning and you're like, I just don't like this. Man, I just can't get it together. But I got to put it all together so I can go to school, so I can go to church tonight. I got to get it. I got I to gotta look the part. And so I come in and you come in and I say, how you doing? You're like, fist bump, great. And the reality of it is you're looking for freedom and self-esteem. And the only place you're going to find it is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to remember this. If you're taking notes, write this down. <clears throat> if you're remembering notes, remember this. <laughs> if you're sleeping, wake up. Is that a good one, Brandon? <clears throat> this is where it's going to all meet together right here for you tonight. It wasn't your worth that brought Jesus down. It was his coming down that brought you your worth. It was not your worth that brought Jesus down. It was Jesus coming down that gave you your worth. Warren Buffett. Anybody know Warren Buffett? Okay. Amen. Rich man. He said these words, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. The world we live in today has become a place that fosters and breeds selfishness. <clears throat> it is a world of me. It's all about me and how I can get, what I can get and how I can get it. We live in an instant gratification society, and when instant gratification is not felt or achieved, it makes us restless. You ever wonder why people come into church, stay for a week or two, and then leave? Because they're restless. Well people, well, people do something for a little while and then they stop because they're restless. They're looking for something and whatever it is they're looking for, they're not finding it where they're at and so they go somewhere else. Fernando Paseo said this, My soul is impatient with itself as with a bothersome child. Its restlessness keeps growing and is forever the same. Everything interests me, but nothing holds me. Everything interests me, but nothing holds holds me, yet we see our restlessness as worth, so we go farther and farther. Listen, there's people in here, you have gone so far in moral debt. What does that mean, Pastor Gary? You've done things that you would be ashamed if people knew. 
you've done things that you hope nobody ever finds out about just looking for that freedom and self-worth. That's moral debt. You keep getting further and further into moral debt, making choices that are poor choices, looking for that moral debt to achieve something that we alone cannot obtain. You can't get there. It doesn't matter how much morally you pay, you can't get there. We through caution to the we throw caution to the wind and moral caution and uh is not an object, and we get farther and farther away from the value of what it is we're looking for. So when we throw moral debt at something we're trying to achieve, we actually get further and further away from the value of it. James Hilton said these words, Surely there comes a time when counting the cost and paying the price aren't things to think about anymore. All that matters is value. I don't care how old you are. I don't know that there's anybody older than me in this sanctuary and I don't know who the youngest person is, but from the oldest to the youngest in here, there is going to come a time when cost does not matter anymore, and it's all going to be about the value. What does that mean? It means that you're going to reach a point in your life where you're going to stand before the Lord, and he's going to judge you. Was it all about the cost, or did you ever value me? Every one of us is going to stand before the Lord and make that determination. And make that Choice. So you can make it today or you can make it at the time of eternity. It's your choice. But you're not going to get away from the value proposition. You're always going to answer for the value that you placed on a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's good, Pastor Gary. It is, really, it is good. The cost of giving up this world and the things in it is far less than the value of following a God who so loved the world. Remember, it was your worth that brought Jesus down. Between cost and value, value is everything. Value is everything. Then I'm going to ask you, we're not going to do an altar call tonight. I'm just going to ask you tonight. I mean, I'm just really really want you to understand the value of a relationship with Jesus and what that means and that the cost is nowhere near the value. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head tonight. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come down front. I'm not going to do any of that. I just kind of want to get a feeling for the sanctuary tonight. <clears throat> if you're safe to me, Pastor Gary, I want to start considering the value because I know that I'm looking at the cost and I want you to pray for me that the Holy Spirit helps me see the value and not the cost. Then I want to pray that prayer with you tonight. I'll pray it from right here. I won't ask you to come. But if there's anybody in here that died, that would like for me to pray with you that you see the value and not concentrate on the cross, cost, just raise your hand and I'll pray for you right where you're at there. I see one hand. I see two hands. Three hands. Anybody else tonight? Pastor Gary, I don't, I don't know the value. You can look up at me just a second. I, I want to be transparent with you. I'm a pastor. I'm not sure that I understand the value. Because if I understood the value, I would be better. So I strive every day to learn the value of my relationship with Jesus Christ. If you can look back at your relationship with Jesus Christ and you have not moved one inch... I would probably say you're concentrating on the cost and have no idea of the value. Because every day when you're in church, in your word, you're reading, you're studying, you're praying, you're singing praise, you're in Sunday school, you're in common ground, whatever it is, every day when you're in God's word, you're understanding more and more about the value and your behavior changes based on the value. So I'm going to pray for those three or four that raised your hand tonight, and then we're going to dismiss. Father, thank you for the privilege and honor to be in your house. God, there's several in this sanctuary tonight, God, that wants to know more about the value of being in a relationship with you. And God, so do I. So God, will you have the Holy Spirit deal with our hearts so that we understand. Let us start looking at the value and not the cost. God, let us understand that you came to... You sent your son Jesus to be on this earth not because of my worth but it's because of him that I gain my worth and God that is through a relationship with him that I gain that freedom that I'm looking for and that self-worth that I need. God, let me understand the value 
and stop concentrating on the cost because the cost will never, ever equal the value. The value will always be greater. God, those that raise their hands tonight, God, I pray the Holy Spirit just really, really ministers to their heart and that they grow closer and closer to you, Lord. We just thank you for all that you do. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight.